started. Um, welcome everyone uh, to this event hosted by the MIT Club of Northern California. My name is Afsana Akhtar. I'm a co-chair of the Healthcare Forum within the club. And I'll, I'll be our host today. I'm very pleased to do that. Uh, I, I graduated with my bachelor's and MEng in course six from MIT. And then I worked in tech for six years. And I've been working in digital health for 15 years after that. So um, I've really enjoyed my time volunteering with the club. This event is part of a series focused on the future of healthcare and disruptive innovation. And we're very excited to have Sandra Clark here with us today. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Asana. Um, and so what I will do is I will briefly read a summary of Sandy's background. But if you'd, if you'd like more detail, she's a wonderful background. Uh, we have Sandy's bio up on the event page. So please feel free to read that. Uh, and then yes, we'll have some, some fireside chat style questions and then uh, we'll look forward to questions from the audience. Uh, so briefly, Sandra Clark is Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer at Blue Shield of California which is a tax paying nonprofit health plan with over 20 billion in annual revenue, serving more than 4 million members. Sandy oversees the company's financial strategy, actuarial functions and financial operations. She also leads enterprise process transformation focused on transforming the member experience while reducing administrative expense. Sandy is responsible for corporate development where she plays a senior role in devising Blue Shield strategies to support growth and to realize the company's mission in transforming healthcare. Sandy brings over 25 years of experience directing worldwide financial organizations across multiple industries. She has a Master of Science in Healthcare Law from Seton Hall University of Law, a Master in Science, a Master of Science in Accounting from Bentley University and a Bachelor of Science in Finance from MIT. Sandy was named by San Francisco Business Times as one of the most influential women in Bay Area business in 2019. Sandy, it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us here today. And it's a rare treat to speak to someone who's the CFO of a very large healthcare organization and also an MIT alum. So um, really, really excited to hear more about your uh, your career and your leadership. But let's start from the beginning. We would love to hear if you can share a bit about your childhood and your journey to MIT. Well, thank you, Afsana. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. And I still wear my, my brass rat. I'm, I'm very proud of my time and my association with, with MIT. I grew up in the Midwest in a really small farming community. Uh, the way I describe it to people is that it had less than, the whole town, including the farming community around it, had less than 4,000 people. I've attended meetings in my career with more people than in my entire hometown. I went to school with the same 60 individuals up through my, my junior year of high school when we then merged with a couple of other schools. So very small, great place to grow up. Um, a little bit of a transition from there to MIT which I really enjoyed and, and I loved Cambridge and uh, had, a, had a wonderful experience with it once I got over the transition shock, but I really, really liked it um, and don't, don't regret it at all. That's great. And then I guess from your childhood, are there any kind of like pivotal moments or role models that you would point out um, that really kind of had a big influence on your life? You know, it sounds a bit corny, but I would say that my grandmothers were both big influences for different reasons. They were independent women at a, a, a time and a, and a place that didn't necessarily support that. My father's mother uh, went to college in the early uh, 1900s, probably the late 1920s, early 1930s, which was extremely rare. And she'd grown up in Chicago and then came down to this small community to teach and met my grandfather. And she was always a big supporter of 
uh, women uh, standing up for themselves, having confidence in themselves and um, going after higher education and, and not, not settling. My mother's mother had a, a different background, much more of a struggle, but also um, felt very strongly that women needed to not, um, not settle, not um, accept a, um, a back seat. I'll go back to, to Cheryl Sanders. You, you need to take, make sure you have your seat at the table and lean in. And they were big supporters of that before it became a thing. And both very, very encouraging about me applying to MIT when a lot of people around me were saying, I don't understand why University of Illinois isn't good enough. And it's a great school. I just wanted something different. And they were hugely supportive as were my parents. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, I, I mean, role models are so important and uh, it's wonderful that you had two as part of your family and that uh, they supported you in making, in making that leap and kind of breaking the mold. Awesome. Well, you know, part of the reason we're all in this alumni group is we love to kind of reminisce uh, about MIT. So I'll, I'll ask, you know, what was MIT like for you and what were some of uh, the more impactful moments uh, from your MIT time? Uh, there would be quite a few, Asana, but I, I would say MIT was hard, especially <laughs> my, freshman, my freshman year. What's this thing called calculus? I'd never seen it before. I, I, I really hadn't. I came in, uh, thank goodness the entire freshman year was pass fail at that point. Uh, although I, I think I, uh, I'm glad that it's now on, I believe, grades in second semester, because I think that's a, an easier transition to sophomore year. But um, it was... It was quite a shock going from this small town. I'd been to Chicago and other places, but now suddenly I'm living in Cambridge, uh, going there, not knowing anybody. I got off the plane and I didn't even know where I was going to live because this was back when it was Russian orientation and freshmen stayed in temporary housing for the first week while the, uh, the men were rushed for fraternities and you picked the dorm where you wanted to live. And I ended up at French House, which was wonderful, lovely people, very supportive, even if you weren't a fluent French speaker, and a great family and, and support group for the entire time that I was there. The other bonus that I got out of, of Russian Orientation Week was that I literally met my husband as I walked off the plane. Um, he is course two. He graduated the year before I did. And he was part of the Panhellenic Council group that was escorting freshmen uh, back to MIT to get their temporary assignments. And Midway Airlines lost my luggage. And it was probably the only time in my life it turned out to be a, a great thing to happen because he was very gallant about helping me try to find it and get back to MIT. And how was I going to get matched back up with my luggage when I didn't know where I was going to be living, all of that. And, and we ended up dating. So um, many years and one son and several degrees later, we are still together, <laughs> several relocations later as well. Well, that is a very sweet story. And, um, you know, I also have to share that I too am married to an MIT alum. So we'll have to start a support group <laughs> for MIT alums who are married to other MIT alums. I like uh, that. Yeah, but you know, I, I will echo a couple of things in, in reminiscing about MIT. I, I also came to MIT from a fairly distant place. I came in as an international student from Bangladesh. And one thing I will say, I had never stepped foot in Boston before I had lived in other cities in the US, but uh, what, what I now appreciate about MIT is just how diverse it was. And coming in as an international student, all the international students, which was, you know, a sum total of 80, mm -hmm. had one week of orientation to ourselves. And it allowed us to settle in and really feel at home before the other 900 freshmen uh, arrived. And so that was a real treat. I think the Institute had really thought that out so well. And uh, I also, uh, the, the other MIT alum that I'm married to now was a sophomore uh, managing international RO for the freshmen that year. So you know, it's, it's really amazing how these things happen. Um, and, you know, I, I think these things, they, they really are uh, defining in our times because as, as we, you know, as we'll talk about other parts of, of your career, it'll be really interesting to see how that, that ties in. But um, kind of 
after MIT, as you entered your career, I, I'd love to hear and maybe share with us what, um, what made you choose the job that you chose once you graduated and what, what did kind of your career evolution look like from that point? Well, when I first applied to MIT, I was originally thinking that I wanted to be an engineer and came to the conclusion that that was not where my interest uh, really was uh, centered. And I, I think MIT's requirement that, especially for freshmen, you're taking a core set of classes and it gives you an opportunity to understand the sciences and some of the more advanced math and really see how that might fit for you is a good thing. And I also love that you get um, a faculty advisor. Mine just coincidentally happened to be at Sloan and was very supportive as I was trying to think through what is it that I wanted to do. And I decided I was really interested in the application of things like calculus to finance and that I, I just enjoyed the, the class that my advisor recommended that I take my freshman year at Sloan. And that was what I wanted to do. But I also knew that I wanted to be part of making something. And, and originally I was thinking of it in a tangible way like manufacturing, but the the recruiters that were coming to MIT that were more on the um, investment banking side or the Wall Street analyst side are very important, but that just wasn't the right fit for me. And I had the opportunity to go to um, just an information session actually for General Dynamics. And the, the gentleman there was uh, really assigned to recruit for engineering positions, but we had a great conversation and he actually asked for my contact information and then called me and said, I happen to have an opening, this was a day or two later, in the schedule, would you like to come in and talk some more? And from there, I ended up uh, getting an offer to be a financial analyst for General Dynamics at their nuclear uh, submarine division in Connecticut, which worked out really well because my husband was down in Connecticut, although we were not married at the time yet. But I loved that um, it was, three different roles in the three years that I was there. I started out doing uh, budget analysis and performance for a submarine. I got to move into more of a divisional FP&A role. And then I got to do what they called subcontract audit. So General Dynamics was very focused on rotating talent as they, they brought it in. And so I had the opportunity to see many things. And I think that one of the things I have found from my MIT education, well, a couple. First of all, the system thinking that MIT teaches you is extremely important, no matter what your particular profession, and is a benefit and a service to you all the way through your career. The other thing is that MIT teaches you so many basic skills that you have an opportunity to be very flexible. I've been in seven different industries. I think that speaks to the education I received at MIT and just at how flexible finance can be if you are curious and you are interested in learning new areas. So all of those were really positive things for me. And from there, we relocated back up to Massachusetts and I went to work for uh, Lockheed in their internal audit group. And I I was a good internal auditor. I was not an outstanding internal auditor because that was not exactly again where my passion was. And I think it was interesting to me, I, I saw a quote in Michelle Obama attributed to her mother where her mother said, make money now, satisfy your, you know, be fulfilled later, which I thought was great. And some of us, I guess, figure that out as we're going because I, I took roles that I thought were interesting. And then I, I learned where my strengths and my aptitudes were as I did them. And I was also, fortunate to have through my career, a number of sponsors and supporters. And I believe that I received that gift because I demonstrated a curiosity about what I was doing and what other people were doing and how the business worked. And I attribute a lot of that to MIT too. You are taught from the beginning to ask why. And, and that becomes important as you go through your career. So I've done, as I said, a number of different roles across many different industries. 
And I've made a few choices that to a lot of people looking from the outside may not have made sense. I've taken a step back title wise once or twice because I felt that the opportunity to learn something in a new industry or a new um, set of activities was worth it. And I, I believe that as I look at my career, it has. And I have a very full resume of, of experiences because of that. And I didn't stay um, wedded to the idea that it had to be a vertical path and it had to be within one particular area. And I, I think those have been important. That's amazing to hear. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about those inflection points. You talked about transitioning between industries um, and we all know, you know, career growth is not linear. So can you talk about some of those changes that maybe you yourself prompted uh, and maybe the changes that were really prompted by your environment? Yeah. Uh, so the, let's see, the first one that was prompted was when we moved from Connecticut back up to Massachusetts and I got into internal audit. And then I realized, oh, and oh, by the way, I wasn't originally planning to go back to work full-time when we moved up to Massachusetts. I was gonna go back to school full-time at MIT. Only we discovered I was gonna have a baby. So let's go to plan B. <laughs> and plan B was to work and go to school part-time. And I got a great education at, at Bentley Masters in Accounting, which balanced really well with the finance and management piece of course yeah. 15 at MIT. And so that was a, that one maybe I guess I'd call the environment. But I also then realized that I didn't want to travel like internal audit required with an infant. And that's when I decided to go back into a financial analysis again, love it, love being a business partner. And I, I made a few choices when I felt that the, the travel balance wasn't right for me in a particular role. And I, I do enjoy travel. I do enjoy getting out to other uh, locations for the business and to meeting my, my business colleagues, internal or external but there were points in my life where that didn't make sense. And so I, I made some choices around that. And then I was working for a water treatment company that had eventually been part of, uh, become part of Siemens. And I'd been there about 11 years. I'd started as a senior financial analyst and worked my way up to vice president of finance. I really enjoyed the company. I'd grown a lot. The company had grown a lot, but I'd hit a point where I was going to need to relocate in order to take that next step. And my son was at a point in his school career where he said, please, mom, don't make me do that. And this, this idea about having it all in perfect work-life balance, uh, let, let's just be honest. Um, balance is being able to live with the choices that you made and that you know you did everything you could to make the right ones that day. And so for me, the right choice and the right work-life balance was instead of saying, yes, I will relocate for that next promotion, was to say, you know what? I've been in water treatment for 11 years now. I think I'll go try something different, which I had no idea how unusual that was at the time. And I ended up going to Phillips Healthcare then and getting a global role, which I had not had before. And that's when I got into healthcare and realized just how much I enjoy this space. And from there, then I had an opportunity about six and a half years later to go be the US head of finance for a Japanese pharmaceutical company. We'll go learn another industry at that point, relocated down to New Jersey. And then Blue Shield called and I'm like, hmm, healthcare's broken. And I think the way it's gonna get fixed is by the health plans and the large employers. I think they're the ones that are really gonna influence the change. And here's an opportunity to work for a company that says they want to create a healthcare system that's worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable. That's a pretty big, hairy, audacious goal and I wanna be part of it. And that, that's how I came here. Uh, so in, in a couple of those cases, as I said, it was a step back in title. It was a big, scary leap but hey, I'd already done that to go to MIT. And this time I had my family to support me and, and it was always worth it. But I think one of the, the things there that I would highlight is that I learned to be really clear on what I could contribute to the company coming in, but what I was gonna learn and be candid about that. Because if it's not a two-way street, I don't think you stay engaged with the job for very often. And so when I interview someone, I will ask them that, what are you gonna get from this? 
Because if they tell me that they know all of it perfectly, first of all, I don't believe it. And secondly, it's not going to be an interesting role for them very long. So. Yeah, that's a, it's fascinating, just the degree of change, mm -hmm. um, you know, industries, type of company and healthcare is it's, it's so heavily regulated. It's so complex, the ecosystem. So I'd love I'd love to hear sort of when you made those transitions, how did you then learn and then excel in those roles? Um, I'm going to give MIT a little bit of credit on that one because <laughs> they do tend to throw you into a class and say, figure it out quickly. Uh, but the other thing I would say, I, I had a colleague once use this phrase, and I think a professor at MIT used it also. Every entity thinks that they're special, and they are, and none of them are all that unique. So every part of healthcare that I've been in has had a lot of things that are similar. They've all had FDA regulation. They've all had very similar uh, rules. Uh, pharmace the pharmaceutical industry probably has the strictest around how you engage with uh, the provider, but all of them have, uh, have a strong compliance structure to them. And the other thing I think that's important is you figure out where the commonalities are and then you start asking questions about how they're different. And, and that degree of curiosity, that sense of trying to understand the business more than, than just my role, but understanding the whole business, so I could figure out how I fit into it and how I could best help. I think those were really important in terms of learning those industries and uh, being able to come up to speed quickly and, and contribute something. You, you shared with us how you arrived at Blue Shield of California. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with that organization. I know that you're wearing many hats right now, right? You're, you're doing finance operations, you're doing actuarial, you're uh, leading a lot of investments, you're on the board on a lot of the um, portfolio companies. Can you share a little bit about sort of how you're tackling all of those things together? And yeah, what, what's it like a day in your life? A day in my life. There is no day that is, is typical other than they start way too early. I am not a morning person. And by the way, I had a, my son when he was a baby was awake at 530 every morning. It was you know, just God's way of, of you know saying hot to me, I guess. But I, uh, I am not a morning person, but it starts early, not, not ridiculously early. And I spend a lot of time in meetings, coaching, other people. And at my point, leadership of, of others is, is really important. And I had to learn, and boy, it was a tough lesson, when I needed to stop trying to micromanage and do it all myself and, and get things done through other people and help them to learn and to grow. And that was, was really, I think, a big leadership adjustment for me at one point in my career. But a day in my life has a lot of conversations across a number of those areas. What's going on with some of our uh, health transformation initiatives? What's going on with our forecast? How are we doing performance-wise, the kind of typical finance things? And then I do get to spend a lot of time on some of the fun things like um, economic modeling scenarios. Yes, that is fun, Asana, for me it is anyway. And, and then the corporate development side, uh, we do direct investing in some companies that are engaged in work with us. We do portfolio investing. And I am a member of several boards that um, are companies in which we have a significant investment. And so I will spend time on, on those matters. I spend a lot of time with my colleagues, uh, the chief operating officer and I are pretty much on the same mental wavelength, I think a lot of the time because we have to run the business. But the way things get done is largely through my team. I have a fabulous team of people and I trust them and I empower them and they go out and handle a lot of things directly and they know to come back to me when they need my input. No, those are great points. Uh, I, uh, you know, I have to, I have to bring up this point because COVID has been such a defining aspect of all of our lives for the past 18 months. And it's wonderful to finally be emerging from that. But you, you were kind of right at the nucleus of healthcare in California. Blue Shield of California has been, um, has had to play such a big role in, in sort of the, the COVID 
scenarios of the state. So what was it like uh, being where you are and, and leading through a crisis such as COVID? It was unlike any experience I'd ever had in my career before. And by the way, I'm really proud of what Blue Shield did. We contributed at no cost a lot of um, employee time and expertise for the testing task force and then again for the vaccine distribution task force. I would say the people who were even more in the heart of it were our healthcare providers and I have an enormous amount of respect for them and the risks that they took on in order to do that. And I'm really glad that we were able to contribute by improving the vaccine distribution so that it could be done a little faster and a little more equitably. But it was interesting when we first started to realize COVID was not going to be just a bad case of the flu, which is what many of us really thought in the early part of 2020 based on the information that we had. And then all of a sudden our, our chief medical officer is telling us that he thinks we ought to be moving people to work from home. And in three days, we moved 7,000 people to work from home, many of whom had never done that before. So we were really um, concerned with employee safety first and then getting the IT systems to be able to support that. And then it was, okay, now I need to look at how this is gonna impact the company because as a healthcare crisis, we had no idea what it was going to mean in terms of expense for us. And it created a need to do a lot of uh, change in our, our ability to do scenario planning. We had a very structured scenario planning process. Like, well, throw that out the window. We've got to be much more flexible about it. And then we started to realize that while it was a healthcare crisis, it was unusual because it was causing people to not go get healthcare. And you, you may realize this, many people do not, that your healthcare coverage can provide your, your doctor with an income in two different ways. One way is uh, what they call fee for service. So the doctor only receives a payment when you go to see the doctor. And then there is a small but growing uh, line where instead a doctor is paid almost a flat fee per month for care of the patient. And then um, if there are um, unusual illnesses, et cetera, there, there's additional adjustment made to that. Well, most providers, whether it's an individual physician or a hospital, are heavily dependent on fee-for-service and people stopped coming. And so all of a sudden, doctors did not have an income. So here you are in a healthcare crisis and a number of providers are having to lay off staff because they don't have any um, income coming in. And I was really proud also of how we uh, got together within Blue Shield and figured out a way to make several hundred million dollars of funding available to providers in our network. And um, a number of them said that it was really impactful for them because of the way we structured it. And we also restructured contracts to make that more of that monthly payment so that providers had a, a guaranteed income stream. So it was a lot of, okay, we're gonna change and we're gonna do this today. And I wouldn't call it fighting fires, but there was definitely a sense of urgency. And when you're in a company this size and in this amount of a, a regulatory structure, you tend to be pretty thoughtful and deliberative about how you do things. And we had to figure out how to accelerate the decision-making in order to respond to these things while staying within the appropriate compliance and regulatory rules. And it, it stretched many of us in, in new ways, which turned out to be a good thing when we got to the end, but oh my goodness, it was tiring. It was really tiring. Yeah, I can imagine. It, it does really sound like an intense period where so many changes had to happen in such a short period of time because so many other organizations that are tied to Blue Shield of California were either relying on your decisions or were in distress and you kind of really had to step up and play a role there. So um, thanks for sharing that. And moving forward, I mean, we're all in this transition now where, you know, we look outside every, you know, the traffic is back, <laughs> hospitals are calling us, asking us to come back for our appointments, the schools are opening up again the economy is open. I mean, this is a lot of good things happening, but it's almost another transition. 
So how is that going? And how do you, looking ahead, what do you see as, you know, some of those good changes that'll, that'll last and others where you think we might, things may go back to how they were? I really did not miss the traffic. I wish that one would <laughs> go back down again. I think it's worse now. Um, I, I think we're gonna have a new normal. It's not all gonna go back to the way it was in, in a few respects. First of all, I think a certain amount of virtual medicine, telemedicine, telehealth, whatever term you wanna use is here to stay. I don't think it's perfect or the right solution for every situation, but we saw a big drop off in the use of emergency rooms as an example. And I think there is an indication from some of the research that's been done that many of those visits that were no longer going to an emergency room didn't need to be there in the first place. And if you're using something like telehealth and you can get hold of a, a nurse or a doctor who can tell you, no, you, you're really not in, in acute distress. You don't need to go in. Uh, th those types of things or uh, better access to specialists for people that live in remote areas. I think those are all things that should continue. Um, I think we're going to continue with some sort of a distributed work environment by and large. Some industries may go back to mainly in person, but I don't think everybody will. I think that's going to change. We've discovered new way to use tools like Zoom. And I think that's important. And the other thing that's not specifically COVID related that did happen over this last year was a lot of uncomfortable conversation finally coming up around diversity and equity and inclusion. And I think that is important to not lose. We already had a big focus on that. We have no pay gap between men and women or white and non-white employees at the same level within Blue Shield. Our head of HR has worked on that very hard for a number of years. Um, but we, I think we've all recognized that there's more that we can do to make sure that every company is more diverse and inclusive. And so I hope we don't lose that um, and that we continue to, to keep a focus on it because certainly some of the best teams I've led have been the most diverse teams where everybody has a voice and I think that as a healthcare provider, or excuse me, a plan that is providing insurance to such a diverse state, we recognize our obligation to make sure that we are walking our talk. No, it, it, it is so important. And one, one very important thing that you, you raised is that you know, a lot of these technologies such as telehealth was there and um, we all bemoaned how underutilized they were previously, but this, this crisis has allowed telehealth to really shine and fulfill its, its purpose in a big way, which is allowing high quality care to happen without people having to be in, in brick and mortar or in the same place. However, the downside is that a lot of research has shown is that telehealth um, is not equally available uh, to people of all backgrounds. And so yes. we need to work harder at that diversity and equity in healthcare now. So it's, it's brought that to light as well. So That's very good point. Yes. Yeah. More work to do, but uh, you know, it, it keeps us all busy. Let's talk a little bit about disruptive innovation. Um, and uh, you know, Blue Shield California is in an interesting spot, right? You are in the heart of Silicon Valley, where so much innovation happens, digital health innovation happens. And um, I'm sure they are all knocking on your door, wondering how they, they can get this, this giant blues plan to really adopt and scale the great innovation that, that they're bringing to bear. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you sort of how, how does Blue Shield of California think about all that? How does innovation happen? How do you work with this innovation ecosystem that's all around you. Well, you're right. We do get a lot of interest and <laughs> we have a lot of interest, Asana, in uh, working with these companies. We've had a, a healthcare transformation agenda for a number of years. As I said, it was one of the things that drew me to the company. And we describe it as a system that is transformed such that it is so high quality that it is worthy of our family and friends and it's sustainably affordable. And you get to that sustainable affordability 
by having healthcare in the digital age. There are so many things that healthcare is not just back in the 2000s, but back in the 80s. I attended a dinner a couple of years ago with a current med student who told me that what I had heard was true. They actually have to teach med students how to use fax machines. Do you know how much still has to be done on a fax machine in healthcare? It's crazy. You would never accept that in any other part of your life. So we do believe that, that digital transformation and disruptive innovation is important. And to your question around how can these companies approach us, I think you and I talked about this a bit before. Um, we have a lot of companies that knock and say they've got the coolest invention since peanut butter. It's great. Okay. What's the value proposition? We want things that drive down the cost of healthcare overall, and not just for the sake of reducing the cost, it's got to improve quality. It's got to improve outcomes for the, um, the members, the patients. So tell me how you're going to help us do that. And then tell me how you're gonna get paid for it. What, what do you think is, is a fair way to show your value? And please don't come to me with, well, we're gonna save $100 and you're gonna share the savings with me. Because as a finance person, I can tell you that most proposals come with some sort of a cost sharing. And I would end up attributing the same savings to six different companies because of how complex outcomes are. And I'd end up with zero savings at the end. So let's work together on a better revenue model for those disruptors. But let's be really clear on what that outcome is and the, um, the clinical evidence show me how you're going to do it. Don't just promise it to me, show me how it's going to work or partner with me on a way to make certain that we can both validate that what you claim is really going to occur. It's true, I can, I can attest to that in having worked in digital health for a while, it, outcomes are so important. And I think all digital health companies have sort of hit that realization that we have to prove the clinical outcomes or, or whatever you know, uh, we are impacting and we mm -hmm. have to show the financial impact as well. Member experience is becoming more and more important. Also, even uh, metrics like STARS and HEDIS are starting to put more, more weight on that. So I think uh, what the digital health community is getting is a clear and consistent message <laughs> from the providers and the plans of what we need to show. Um, but, but it is still, it's, sometimes it's that chicken and egg to measure the outcomes, we have to work with the plan to get the data and do that, right? So I think a lot of digital health suffers from that conundrum, which is um, to prove the outcomes, we have to actually utilize the service at a, at a reasonable scale. I think that's a fair point. And, and your, your comment about member experience is spot on. Something that improves your health but makes you miserable in the process is not good. So the, a positive member experience has to be table stakes. And what you're saying is, is valid that you sometimes need, it, it, it becomes that you can't get the deal until you've had a deal so that you've been able, you can't collect the data until you've had a deal to collect the data. But if you're going to propose something like that, being able to articulate what we're both going to learn and what you expect to see from it, and maybe don't charge me for the fact that you want me to partner with you on this, um, I, I would say is really important. And if I could just put one more plug in for, for you digital or, or, or other disruptors, please understand that when we put you through the hoops about personal health information, data security, et cetera, it is not because we are trying to be difficult. We have HIPAA requirements that we must um, honor. And, and so we have to make sure that you're going to protect it equally. No, very important point. Um, thank you. Well, uh, we have a few questions in the chat window. And I'm going to ask if I'll read out the names and I'll invite you to maybe uh, state your comment or ask your own question. So Greg, Wolf, I think you were first, if you wouldn't mind coming off mute and sharing your question. Oh, thanks, Asana. Hi, hi, Sandra. I, I appreciated the story about the uh, small Midwestern town and showing up in Boston with, uh, you know, never having been there. Uh, for me, it was like midnight, I think, when I arrived. I, you know, first ride in a cab and stuff. And I was from Missouri, so not too far away. Um, 
But it, but it brings up this point of, you know, you grew up in a small town, relationships are everything, mm -hmm. right? And one of the challenges, one of the things that I see is broken in healthcare is that collectively, we don't know how to value relationships. A, a good doctor, a doctor who cares, a nurse who cares can make the difference in outcomes. Absolutely, we know this, but you cannot see that on the balance sheet. You cannot see that in the marketplace. You cannot see it when Silicon Valley, when you, when you bring an innovation to market, you cannot see that this innovation actually drives up the value of those relationships, increases the number of connections or decreases it. We just don't have that. It's not visible in the way we do the accounting and, and the way the marketplace works because uh, you know, we know how to value transactions. We know how to value pharmaceutical drugs, you know, and you take a pill, but we don't know how to value the investment in relationships. And if you're spending, you know, I talked to concierge, people who work in concierge practices and they say, I spend an hour with somebody, get to know them. It really improves the actually the, and, and improves the efficiency, but that's not how most practices practice. And it's not the way that the billing works. And so I'm curious from your perspective, do you see any way in which that value of the relationships really is starting to show up or we can, we can find a, a, a way to make that visible so that we can see which innovations really are improving on that measure, because it does, we, we know it affects the, the outcomes. We just don't know how. So I don't know if I have a perfect answer for your, your question. I agree with you on the relationships. I also would say that um, if, if you also came from a small town, you know that getting good quality healthcare in those locations is a real challenge because it's very difficult to attract the, the, yeah. the type of caregivers that, that you need in, in those locations. And they have to be very uh, adept at dealing with quite the range of people because they're likely to see the new baby and the geriatric yep. patient. Blue Shield is very focused on new payment methods for providers that take into account that whole experience. So when I talked about fee-for-service versus a capitated or a risk-sharing arrangement, we actually are working on what we consider to be the next step in that uh, payment structure where you're not just paying a provider to assume the, the full risk for a patient, but you are, are paying them in a, a more balanced way that measures not just are you, are you being cost effective or, and cost efficient, but what's the member satisfaction? And, and they get a chance to weigh in on that. What are the clinical outcomes? Is their diabetes getting better or staying well-maintained? Did they have um, as positive an, or an experience, I guess, as it could be with an oncology treatment? Did they feel that they were treated as a person and that they were truly part of a shared decision as opposed to the, the providers not having enough time to have a thorough discussion and just telling them this is what you need to do? So we believe that changing the payment structure to incorporate those things helps to value that relationship. Uh, one example is we were piloting some of this with a doctor or we were going to and we were, we were trying to explain to them what we had in mind and, and showing the doctor the, the types of conversation that we wanted him to have with the patient in this particular specialty. And the doctor said, all that sounds great, but I can't do that in 15 minutes. And my CEO said, no, we, we don't expect you to. We, we figure this is going to take 60 to 90 minutes and we're gonna pay you for that amount of time because we wanna make sure it's a complete conversation. And this was a, not a, a, a new doctor, it was a very experienced one. And he had a hard time wrapping his mind around that concept because for so long it's been hurry up, just keep the cost down and crank as many patients through as you can. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I know that providers are doing everything they can and spending an awful lot of their personal time on their patients. Uh, but that fee-for-service revenue model is, is not ideal for being able to keep that kind of a, a patient experience at the top of the list. So hopefully that addresses at least to some extent what your question was. Yeah, no, I appreciate hearing that. Thank you. And, and, and I think there's just a, a lot of opportunities there. So. Agreed. Great. Thank you, Greg. We have a question from Divya Chab. I'm sorry, I don't, I can't see your full name, but Divya, if you wouldn't mind. Thanks. Hi, Sandra. Um, thanks for taking the time. 
Um, so I co-founded a company that works on clinical decision support, um, especially in value-based care settings. So I was wondering what kind of role uh, payers have in encouraging the use of clinical decision support tools that can eventually result in those cost savings and maintained or improved patient outcomes, as you were mentioning. Do they have a role or is it more left to the health systems um, to kind of decide on what to use? We are strong proponents of shared decision-making for the instances uh, like deciding on treatment for a particular cancer diagnosis uh, that the patient uh, can and should truly be engaged as opposed to just getting a, a sheet that says, here, I gave you your options and this is what I'm telling you to do and sign it. Other types of clinical decision support, I, I, I'd say we certainly encourage it where the evidence shows that it makes a difference. We aren't providing the care. So we want to be careful that it doesn't look like we're trying to dictate how the doctor practices medicine. In fact, we believe that we should be providing tools that enable doctors to practice more independently and, and not um, uh, have, have such a, a prescribed um, regimen about how they ought to treat a patient versus treating the, what the patient needs. So I'd say it, it depends a little bit on what you mean by the clinical decision support as to whether it would be something that we would incorporate into um, the standard of care that we would encourage a doctor to be providing, like is it shared decision-making or is it, is it something else that is better left to the medical community to decide if it should be utilized? Okay, that's helpful. Um, I can let you move on to the next question. Thanks. Sure. Thank you for your question. We have a question from Maya Roy, which she's asked me to read. And her question is, uh, what do you think the future holds in terms of paying for and supplying long-term care, particularly as the U.S. population ages? How do you think the public and or private insurance will adapt to care for the elderly? Wow, I wish I had that answer because personally, I'm dealing with a lot of that myself right now. Uh, my, my mother is, is still um, healthy and living in Boston, actually. My father lives in the town where I grew up and has had a lot of, of health issues and recently moved into um, a, an assisted living location. And some of you may have seen a LinkedIn post that I did last fall when he had a, a, a medical incident and I got to experience the healthcare system as the advocate for um, an older person. And boy, I wish I had the answer to your question. Right now, I also find it interesting that long-term care is not considered healthcare. It is not covered typically by a health insurer. It's, it's handled by an entity that just covers that. And then of course, Medicare and, and Medicaid. So personally, and this is not Blue Shield talking, this is Sandra talking, I think there needs to be more connectivity there. Um, I also think it's really a shame that we pay more for care in a home, in a, in a group setting versus being able to pay for things that keep people in their homes. So as an example, we discovered that Medicare will not cover my father having a, they call it a transfer bench, but a seat in his shower so that he could shower safely. He's a fall risk. They would not pay for um, the bars that would assist him uh, quite bluntly to sit on the toilet and be able to get up and down safely without falling. Uh, they would not pay for somebody to come in and make sure that he was eating diabetic appropriate meals. That's not considered part of Medicare coverage. But if you then deteriorate enough that you have to go to a long-term care facility, then that gets covered in a different way. So again, that's a personal statement, not a blue shield statement. I do feel that there's got to be an answer that connects these things a little bit more holistically. Blue Shield does look at what we call whole person health. Other people call it social determinants. But the idea being that there are many things that impact a person's health before they ever interact with the system. And I think what you're highlighting is a perfect example of that. For our elders, we have to look at better solutions 
to keep them safe and healthy longer before we need to put them into that kind of a setting. So I'm sorry I don't have a better answer other than I violently agree with you. Well, I think it's a topic that a lot of uh, people are thinking about. It's, it's a big area of focus and it's even become an area of focus for private investment startups. So there's, there's some great companies trying to, to create better solutions, not only for caring for seniors in their home so that seniors can stay home and independent longer where they're happier, uh, but also kind of the, the financing of all this. Um, thank you for that question. Next, we have a question from Sophia Yen, if you'd like to read your question. Sure. Um, <laughs> let me find it. Let's see. Oh, is uh, Blue Shield doing anything to increase access to doctors via telemedicine, specifically political and legal? Because, you know, as a physician, I'm board certified by the American Board of Pediatrics, and I didn't take a California specific test or a New York specific test, but it's absolutely ridiculous that I need to be. Um, license in every single state, apply to every single state, write them all a check, follow their weird wacky CME by state. And then I had to be fingerprinted so many times. And it's like, why can't Michigan accept California's fingerprints? Like what, if it's good enough for California, it should be good enough for you. Feels like the, the ought to be the equivalent of reciprocity on a, a driver's license, doesn't it? I, yes. yeah, I, I hear you. Um, the number of times that I've had to do something similar as an officer of the company and not nearly to that extent. It also reminds me of my colleagues with uh, uh, CPA licenses that are not honored from state to state. Uh, but as far as Blue Shield goes, we are advocates for um, more um, access to telemedicine. In fact, we, we've been promoting it for years before uh, the the need really accelerated during COVID. A uh, quick story, for those of you in Northern California, you might remember the Paradise Fires a couple of years ago where the whole town burned to the ground. And there was a clinic there and it was the only one in the area. And they were gonna be working with us on some pilots and this health transformation initiative that we have. And when the, and when the clinic burned down, everybody scattered. I mean, the whole town burned down, everybody scattered. And the doctors were trying to figure out how to make payroll, but how to keep people together. And so we, we switched talking about being a little bit flexible, even in a big company and worked with them on um, a, a telehealth uh, pilot to see if they could uh, continue to stay connected and care for their patients remotely. So we had an inkling that this was gonna work even before it became in such hot demand for COVID. Uh, we do advocate. I, I am not close enough to what's going on with our government affairs team in terms of the interactions that they have at the state and federal level. I know we do partner with the California Medical Association on a number of things that we feel are good for doctors and for our members. And, and certainly access to telemedicine is a big one um, for a number of specialties and particularly in the behavioral health or mental health space where you, you need to have often 24 hour coverage and that's a lot easier to do if you can do it across multiple time zones. Uh, so I, I don't know the specifics around it other than I know it's a topic that we're not just sitting saying, yeah, that really ought to happen, that, that we have been active in some way. Great, thank you for that. We, we'll take there are two more questions in the chat. We'll do those and then we'll come back to some sort of con concluding uh, questions here. But um, both of these have to do with the federal government. So uh, you know, uh, the first one is um, from Nathan. And Nathan, if it's okay, I'll just read it since it's, it's nice and compact here. Uh, what impact do federal regulations like HIPAA and FDA have on the industry's ability to deliver care? Um, overall, I would rather have those regulations than not have them. I think that they do more good than they block good. With that said, there's always the law of unintended consequences. Uh, HIPAA gets misinterpreted and misused, I think, in many instances that create issues with being able to share 
information with patients' families. And also uh, some of the interoperability is a term you may have heard about the sharing of information uh, be between doctors and, and across uh, systems of care. And, and that could use some work. And I know that there have been new regulations passed on that in the last couple of years. But I think the fact that HIPAA makes sure that you, your, um, your information is not at least legally out there being monetized um, to a great degree is a good thing. And the FDA has taken some hits lately. I you know, have my, my own personal opinions on, on a few things, but when you look at the overall good that they do, and I had the, um, the privilege of uh, working with Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He was a board member at a prior company of mine, and I have, he's, he's just a, a brilliant guy and passionately dedicated to uh, the right kind of, of care and, and um, medical um, appropriate treatment for all Americans. And I think that, that people like him are extremely important in our healthcare system to protect from those who are a little more concerned with shareholder returns than the good of the, the overall health of the population. So I'd rather have them and deal with some of the consequences. Um, we'll take one last question here and then uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. The question was actually, uh, what are the most important initiatives you believe the federal government could take to improve the US healthcare system. And this question was from Dan. Sorry, Dan, I can't, it's not displaying your full last name here, but yes. Mo what are the most important initiatives you believe the federal government could take to improve the US healthcare system? I think, um, well, two things that Blue Shield believes in that I'm, are, are reasons why I, I joined and, and I'm part of the company. One is that your your patient information is yours and you should be able to decide how it gets used. It's not owned by a healthcare system or owned by the uh, software company that runs the software for the healthcare system, but it is actually owned by you and you should get to decide what to do with it. I think the government could do more around uh, regulations for these personal health apps like Fitbit that currently aren't covered by HIPAA as an example, so that your information isn't protected in one place and not protected in another setting. Um, I, I believe in, um, as part of that owning your data, that the government could do more about one, what we call a longitudinal patient record, so that I wouldn't have to try and go back to the doctors that I've seen in Fairbury, Illinois, and uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and New Jersey, and here in California, to try and assemble my health history, or I'm sure you've seen seniors that have a book this thick trying to keep it all straight because their information is scattered. If there was one place that where we controlled our personal data, but the doctors could access it with our permission, I think that the government could do a lot to help make that happen. And I believe that there are opportunities for the government to help control the rate of healthcare cost increases without stifling innovation. I'll put in a plug that there's an initiative right now at the state level that's being discussed um, around an office for healthcare affordability, which would be, I think, a bit similar to some of the things that Massachusetts has done. And, and it requires uh, a participation across the healthcare spectrum to, to truly work together on bringing down the rate of, of increase. And I think the federal government could weigh in on that and um, have a, a pretty significant impact there. Great, well, thank, <clears throat> thank you for those questions, everyone. We, we have a couple of questions to wrap up. One is, uh, Sandy, if you can, you know, if you, you could share with us you know, we know your day job keeps you very busy, but if there are causes or initiatives that you work on that are a personal passion for you, um, what are some of those? Um, well, the thing that kept me sane through COVID was hiking in the East Bay. So uh, just as a, a personal way to, to get away, clear my head, get some fresh air and stay sane, that was, that was really, really important for me. Uh, in terms of, of causes, I passionately believe in... Um, uh, preventing cruelty to animals 
Uh, we've, we've rescued every pet we've had for 20 plus years. And you may have heard some noise in the background at one point. I have 130 pound St. Bernard at the moment, and he is a key part of our family and how people can ever mistreat an animal. I just don't understand. So that one's big for me. And I believe very passionately in um, uh, food security because for many people, their, their health is dependent on the, the quality of the food that they can eat. And in many places in this country, you can't get good quality food, you can't afford it, or you just don't have access to it. So that's, that's very important to me. And I do support those. Uh, the one that I've recently supported because I did not appreciate just how bad an issue it was until the um, COVID shelter in place order started was that there are um, families, uh, mothers in this country that cannot afford diapers and formula. And it became particularly bad during the pandemic when people who could afford it were stockpiling and people who were dependent on things like WIC coupons were not able to um, find it because they were only allowed to buy a certain amount at a time and it wasn't available. So I have donated to a diaper fund and to a couple of things like that because I just, I just think it's necessary. Yeah, no, the excellent points. I know that uh, all of, all of these services that um, we're doing just such an amazing job helping people get food um, the food pantries. And then what you mentioned, I was not aware of, as you said, kind of diapers and formula. So um, thank you for sharing. And if you want to, you know, name some of those organizations, maybe, maybe folks would like to contribute there as well. I strongly advocate for using Charity Navigator and supporting them. I think they do a really good job of, um, of vetting worthwhile organizations. It's not perfect. There are some that are too small to get a rating from them but I go there and I find the right matches for specifically what I want to do. But there is one called the Diaper Fund Network. But if you go to Charity Navigator, you're likely to find something that speaks to you and, and does good. Yeah, thank you. So our last question is, is really, given the theme of this discussion is about leadership and it's, it's one, you know, if you, if you reflect back on your career, your life, what are some of those uh, kind of most poignant leadership lessons that you've learned and that you would share with others, particularly women who are striving to get into uh, leadership roles, whether it be in healthcare or finance or any other function. My grandmother said to me once, if you don't toot your own horn, nobody else will. And I thought that was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. And then I realized later in life, by golly, she was right. Because, and, and what I mean by that is for women, I would say you have to be your own advocate. You are, I, I, Sheryl Sandberg's book about Lean In had a lot of truths in it, whatever you may think of, of Facebook and her role there, but making sure that you speak up, that you advocate for yourself, that you are um, you're not, you don't have to be viewed as pushy, but if you have a point of view that you say it and you don't let other people take credit for your activities. Um, what I said before, work-life balance is not that you have this perfect um, uh, middle of the teeter-totter every day. It's, did you make the best choices you could for the day? Can you look at yourself in the mirror? I, I looked at my son at one point and I said, you know, Josh, if I didn't make the same mistakes as my family did, at least I learned. So you, 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 you do the best you can. And I, I think that that's important. I also think that if you're struggling with, uh, should I work or should I not work? It's whatever you think, again, that you can live with best. Personally, for me, I am very appreciative that I continue to work. And I had that amazing work family and that kind of support. Um, and I would say that some of the best lessons I have learned came from some of my, oh my goodness, I can't believe that worst moments. Uh, things where I might've derailed my career if not for a sponsor. Oh, get your... Make sure that you look for sponsors and mentors. They're very, very important because when you have those cringeworthy moments, they will be there to help you. So I think that would be my last one. And enjoy what you do. If at all possible, enjoy what you do. Well, those are some amazing lessons and amazing words to uh, conclude our event. So Sandy, I wanna thank you so much for spending your, you know, we'll, we'll call it our happy hour, your happy hour with us. 
uh, to speak to our MIT alumni. And I think this alumni organization is, is a fabulous opportunity and forum for that support. A lot of the things that you've mentioned, uh, mentorship, support, advocacy. Uh, so I think the alumni event, I give them a shout out, has been, has been really great at that, especially during COVID. I don't know if everyone knows, but the MIT Club of Northern California, MIT CNC, was recently given the award, uh, the, the Dome Award. I don't know the full name, but it's because during COVID, this club had 100 events in 100 days. So 100 virtual events in, a, in 100 days. So I mean, talk about in the spirit of our mascot, the beaver, talk about being dexterous, but it was really appreciated because a lot of people were isolated, were lacking that that social support and that social connectivity. Um, and I and I think it was it was appreciated and it was recognized uh, by the institution. So I think credit goes around to everyone. But thank you again, Sandy, and thanks everyone for tuning in. And and please stay tuned. We'll have more of these in the future. Thank you, Afsana. And thank you, everyone, for spending your time with me and for the great questions. I really appreciate it. Have a great night. Great. Take care, everyone. Good thank night. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Take care. Serena, thank you so much. Um, appreciate everything you did to help organize the event. And um, yes, we will wait on you to close it out.